thank you very much. So to, to begin at the beginning, as Mary said, I'm a business writer in my day job, and I'm, I've always had a passion for history, particularly the history of this wonderful city. And I've often wondered how, when we nearly went bust in the 19th century, how we managed to pull round again and, and pull ourselves out of the terrible situation we found ourselves in. And by chance, I was writing an article for um, a big gas company about um, the economies of various countries around Europe, and, and it was Italy. And it, I, I've discovered that in Italy, after the Second World War, they had discovered huge reserves of natural gas, which pulled them back out of the, the worst of the, the Second World War. They're, they're being completely on their knees after the war to suddenly becoming very, very successful, particularly in Northern Italy. And that's made me think, I wonder if that was true of Norwich. And talking to friends at Friends of Kett's Heights, we, I started thinking there must be a connection. The, the fact that our economy was so profitable and then went so downhill and then came back up again, it looks as though the timings are right. So this talk is really a sort of detective tour investigating whether my hunch was true. So we begin, oh, this is what I always put it, but this is not gonna work. I can't move my slides, so sorry, everybody. I need help from somebody. Recording in progress. So sorry about so this. Sorry about this. Oh, no, it, it just moved, yeah. It moved, yeah, that's it, good. Sorry about that. So the story begins in the golden age of Mary's economy when we've got tremendous wealth. And this most of you will know this picture. It's Cotman's uh, painting of Norwich Market in about 1820 something. And this was a time of tremendous prosperity. And for hundreds of years, as we all know, this was the second city of the country. And you've only got to look around the city see the fabulous wealth of the cathedral and all sorts of wonderful buildings. We were very, very, very rich indeed and had been so for hundreds of years. And maybe one of the finest buildings of that time was the Assembly House and it's such a beautiful, beautiful building. And you can imagine the glittering events there. And somehow to me that sums up just how wealthy we were. Such a, a glamorous life, such a wealthy city. And this is how we made our money. We made our money on what was known as Norwich stuffs, which were very fine textiles, which we produced by hand on, ha on hand looms, which I'll come back to in a moment. Very, very highly regarded, not to be brutal, the most amazing textiles you've ever seen. They're not at the top of the market, like the damasks of, of Florence or that kind of thing, but nevertheless, pretty good and we made an awful lot of money out of it. It was a global trade. Centred, centering on Norwich, uh, we, we exported to uh, Portugal and th then on to uh, South America and into Spain and other parts of South America, down to South Africa, across the entire um, British Empire, of course, out to the East Indies uh, via the um, East India Company, where it was headquartered in modern Pakistan, across the whole of Europe, into Russia, to China. It, apparently the Chinese particularly liked our red silks, uh, red um, stuffs. So very, very successful indeed, and pretty impressive. It's an interconnected industry. We've got makers, suppliers, financial services, all tied in with this very lucrative trade. And if you were to walk along Colgate at the time that I'm talking of, the 1750s, you'd have seen lots and lots of fantastic merchant houses. I think Pevsner lists at least half a dozen really fine merchant houses. And a bit like the houses, you, the merchant houses you see in Venice, the, the merchants had their showrooms on the ground floor, their living quarters on the floor above, and the workmen, uh, the, the workforce, high above that. And as most of you will know, a very typical thing about Norwich buildings is what's called a lucum window. I mean, you can see a whole load of nest of lucum windows right up in the roof here, and that's where the hand looms were. So I believe unique to Norwich, but no doubt people will be able to tell me whether that's true or not. 
And the technology, it was, has to be said, pretty primitive. This is a hand loom you'll, you'll see in the Bridewell Museum. And the, 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 it's got quite a complex setup for, for weaving, but quite an important thing to note is it's not something you could scale up to, to, to the industrial scale of the Industrial Revolution, as we shall see in a moment. So summing up, it's, it's a lucrative trade. It's very highly skilled workforce. It's a uh, quite primitive technology. It's not that different from anything you'll see across um, the world in places where they haven't mechanized. Nevertheless, very, very wealthy. All that wealth, what could possibly go wrong? Quite a lot. We have the Napoleonic Wars with volatile markets, which during the Napoleonic Wars, we've got um, the whole of the European market is cut off from us. It affects the East India Company as well, and lots and lots and lots of other outlets. So that put us very much on the back foot. The financial services that supported us were also put on the back foot. The, a very volatile time for the, for the, the local banks. So tricky, tricky times in terms of markets and money. This, is, this all begins to feel a bit like now, and I apologize for that. Then we have, of course, the Industrial Revolution. And what the Industrial Revolution is predicated on is scale, it's, it's, it's uh, local um, sources of, uh, of coal, local sources of water, local sources uh, of cheap labor. We've got the cheap labor, we had very low wages in Norwich, but we haven't got the, the coal, we haven't got the water. So we can't afford to do this kind of thing. We did try. This is St. James's Mill in uh, Whitefriars, and that was set up as a textile mill in, I'll just have to check my notes here for when this happened. It was in 1840. It was set up as the Norwich Yarn Company, but the business wound up within 10 years. So we just hadn't got the, the know-how, we, we couldn't afford it. We were really in difficulties. And then there's competition from the North. This is Arrowvale Cotton Mill in Rochdale. And as you can well imagine, we couldn't possibly compete with cotton, which we won't go into how cotton was produced and costed. We just could not compete with that with our woolen textiles. And if you have a look at this particular mill, you can see it's got all the things we haven't got. It's got abundant local coal nearby. You've got a canal. You've got plenty of, of investment into a big, big factory, which is completely beyond our pockets. Eventually, and not that soon, we were overtaken by Bradford, which was nicknamed Worstedopolis because of the textile that we had pioneered, Worsted. So we've lost our precious Worsted monopoly. It, the, we've rapid, we rapidly fall into decline. Bradford starts out as, in 1800 as a small market town. By 1841, it had two thirds of England's wool production. And by 1850, it's become the wool capital of the world and it's still a very important centre for textiles. Hence, there were lots and lots of very substantial Victorian buildings, which you just don't see in Norwich. This, by the way, is not their most important municipal building, far from it. It's Bradford Technical College, seen here in a postcard from the 1890s. It was founded in 1832, but this building was, uh, was opened in 1880. So, and they focused on the textile trade to this day. We couldn't do anything like that. We didn't build our technical college until much, much later, 50 years later, 1899. And this, of course, is the Technical Institute as part of, now part of NUA, Norwich Art School. And this was not for textiles, it was to support the shoe trade, which we will come on to again in a moment. We were so broke, we couldn't afford to replace our civic buildings. So where other towns were building magnificent town halls, as we'll see in a moment, this is what we were stuck with, our medieval guild wall, which was never replaced just as well. This is Manchester's town hall. So you can see quite a contrast there that this, they had that kind of money, we absolutely didn't. However, it's worth saying smugly that when Bradford became, a, Bradford didn't become a city till 1974, almost 800 years after we did in 1194. So we did get something right. By the 1820s, our fine city was almost finished. Most people thought we would never recover. Intense economic hardship. And the second, it would have been the second city of, of the country since 
Jacobean or even Tudor times, and now we've fallen into 14th place and we're falling fast. Things were so bad that the Royal Commission, uh, a Royal Commission was set up, and I'll read from my notes here, into the state of large towns and populous districts in 1845. And this is quoting from their report. Norwich, it is feared, has seen its best days as a place of commerce and would appear to be in that painful state of transition from a once flourishing manufacturing prosperity to its entire decline and must before long revert to its original condition of a capital of an extensive agricultural district. Neglect and decay, decay are now conspicuous in the streets and quarters occupied by the working classes so as to render them places of the most dismal aspect. And there were lots of reports at the time that were really, really shocking. Very, very high poverty. It would be some of the highest rates of poverty in the country with the, the, the weavers out of work. Pretty tough. People thought we were finished, all washed up, but they were wrong. An astounding invention was about to change everything. It's appropriate I took this picture in France because that's for the first attempts to manufacture gas commercially were in France. Philippe Le Bon around 1795 to 1805, but it was the British who pioneered successful commercial gas utilities. Frederick Windsor, London-based gas light and coke company, 1812. So I begin to think that maybe my hunch was right that we didn't go the way of Lavenham and go, for, go broke because just at the right moment, an amazing invention changes everything. 1830, gas arrives at Bishop Bridge. And I, I was saying at this point that the, the really significant thing about gas is that when you bring in a, a, a load of a barge of coal, you get two for the price of one. You get gas, which is for cheap heating and lighting, and you get coke, which means a, a cheap and very reliable form of coal. And that is what suddenly made everything affordable. So this is the main gas works. It's convenient for the coal barges to bring the essential raw material by water and then to unload directly at the gas works. The railway doesn't exist yet. That we were late adopters. That didn't arrive until 1844. So there's a vast new site at the Bishop's Bridge, which had developed over several decades. And it was several different um, gas refinery plants. And as you can see, it's pretty, pretty big area. But then we started to expand quite a bit more. This is the Bishop Bridge Gas Works in 1945. And I took this picture from the, the wonderful City of Norwich plan 1940, of 1945, which was, as many of you will know, was produced as a sort of vision for the future at, after the Second World War, for after the Second World War, when we moved back into recovery. The city council was not a fan of the gas works, I think it's fair to say, and I'll quote. From the points of view of planning and amenity, it is questionable whether a more unfortunate site could have been found for these works. They have spoiled not only the area of four acres or so on which they stand, but the whole vicinity is incongruous and unsightly. Well, not everybody agrees with that because I think the gas holders were beautiful, but we shall see. So a quick timeline here. So gas, turns up in Norwich in 1820 at the Norwich Gaslight Company in St Stephen's. That's a pretty small setup and they don't even use coal, they use whale oil, which is fantastically expensive. But by 1830 they've established the British Gaslight Company at Bishopbridge. Then there's a new gas works added at St Martin Palace, St. Martin Palace Plain, much, much bigger. By 1903 all the gas production transfers to St Martin Palace Plain and Bishop Bridge is for purification storage only. A new compressor station 50 years later at Bishop Bridge, which supplies gas to Cromer and Sheringham. So originally the gas was just for the city, city area. 1958, a gas holder erected at Cromone Lane. Then expansion to, at Cromone Lane, propane gas pipeline comes from Felixstowe. So we're getting the beginning of British natural gas. By 1963, uh, the gas production has finished even at St. Martin Palace Plain, so we're not producing our own gas at all anymore. It's all natural gas coming from the North Sea. And from 1964 to right now, gas is supplied by an underground pipeline to, from the Baxton Gas Terminal, which passes through Ketz Heights. And the end of the gas story for Norwich, the gas holder is demolished on Gas Hill in 2018. There were also private gas production plants around the city, supplying factories and the railway, much the same as you have generators for factories nowadays. 
And here's a George Plunkett photograph of St. Martin at Palace Plain in 1965, pretty enormous. I'm told that you can still see the, the gateposts. That's all that remains and behind the magistrate's courts facing St. James's Mill. That I haven't checked out, but it's, I believe it to be so. And I hope somebody will be able to confirm or deny that when I finish speaking. And here's another new, this time from Bishopgate, and you can see the Adam and Eve pub in the background. So this is a huge beast, really, really big. It's all gone, but at the time, it made a massive difference to Norwich's fortunes, as we shall see. Because if we're looking at the dates of how nothing major was built from about 1800 until 1850, when we started to get back off our knees again, it does seem to me that gas was the, the factor that made all the difference. So a very quick recap of how gas is made. I'm absolutely not technical about this. In my understanding of it is pretty feeble, but we start with coal being mined in somewhere like Newcastle. It's put onto a barge, it's brought down to the gas works. They then do all sorts of terrifying things with it to convert it into gas and coke. And then it's then distributed to the end consumers. So we see here the gas lighting in the streets and the coke is then used to power factories in an affordable way that had not been possible before. So how gas changes the city? This is an industrial skyscape uh, from a wonderful book I've got. It, it dated about 1910. And we, we know that it can't be earlier than that because the Roman Catholic Cathedral is visible in the distance. This is from, I believe, from Mousehold Heath. And you can see an absolute forest of industrial chimneys. None of this was there before about 1850 at the earliest. And most of the factories didn't arrive until a little bit later when commercial confidence picks up, there's investment in, in new ventures and things change really from very slow recovery in the 1850s to really ramping up production and changing the face of the city completely. The thing we moved into, we dropped textiles because we just couldn't compete. So the big industry we moved into was the boot and shoe manufacturing. And this is not a, 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 nilla, a painting Take, drawn at the produced at the time in 18, 1850s, it's, it's an artist's impression of what it, what it actually looked like. So bear with me a second. So this, yes, this is an impression, uh, an artist's impression of, of 1846, and it's taken from a wonderful book I have called Norvik Century about the Norvik shoe factory and its century of existence. And my copy actually is, is dated 1946. And in 1946, this is what the Norvik Shoe Factory looked like. And most of you will know this as being nowadays the Jane Austen Academy and the, the, the wonderful what last wine bar on the corner. So on exactly the same site as the artist impression that we see earlier, we've got St. George Colgate opposite. And we're looking down Colgate, down towards Firebridge in the distance. This in its day was the biggest shoe factory in the country, absolutely enormous. And that's, as I've said before, none of this was possible before about 1850. So it does seem to me there's a, a connection. And we get lots of other shoe factories popping up around the city. This is now known as Seaboam House in Queen Street. And it was the Haldenstein factory and then the Bally Shoe Factory. A very, very splendid building. I did make a note it was uh, yeah, the architect of that is Edward Boardman in 1872. We've got any number of splendid examples of wonderful shoe factories. But that wasn't the only show in town. There was also the engineering sector, very big sector, not as big as shoes, but it was nevertheless an important sector. And this is a very fuzzy photograph of a Sopwith camel taken at uh, the Imperial War Museum. But they were, they were actually built here. They were, uh, Bolton and Paul had their factory at the railway station where they um, made the parts, then they hauled them up Gurney Road to the top, to Mousehold, assembled them, and then took off from there. So great stuff that made quite a difference to the outcome of the First World War, built here. And other very well-known um, engineering sector firms, this is Barnard Bishop, and they were famous for very lovely decorative ironwork, particularly the, um, the gates at Sheringham, uh, sorry, Sandringham, and also you'll find examples of their decorative ironwork all around the city at the railway station, um, bridges, all sorts. Really wonderful work. But they made their, a lot of their money from 
wool knitting, which they a, a, a industrial practice that they pioneered and they sold that across the entire empire. So we see here the the um, the, the what was known as Norfolk Iron Works. It's now social housing called Barnard's Yard, which is, you can still see traces of the original building, but in its heyday, quite astonishing, absolutely enormous building with five storied workshops, uh, blacksmiths, um, the special factory for the wire netting, at the, I believe at the back, huge, really vast. Another one that is still with us is Lawrence Scott Electromotors, the Gothic Works, which you can see from the railway line. They're at Hardy Road in Thorpe Hamlet. They also were tremendous pioneers and they are still going strong. So another of those companies that set up on the back of the, the, the cheap gas. Financial services picked up again. I couldn't resist the excuse to put the Marble Hall in, which was built, I believe. Let me just check when that was built. I'm sure most of you will know. 1860, uh, so no, it was completed in 1912. So one of our most important sectors, which picked up again after the, the crash, very bumpy times in the early 18, 1900s, sorry, 18th, the early 19th century, we had banks like the, the Crown Bank uh, built in 1866. That was, that's a, a pretty depressing story, but we'll focus on this one. This is such a sign of restored confidence, I think, that it, it kind of symbolizes how we, we perked up again. And another sector that's important for Norwich, not, again, that has largely vanished now, um, companies like Coleman's. This is Reed's Mill on Riverside. And that started out as uh, another failed uh, textile mill, the Albion Spinning Mill, which was for worsted silk and mohair. And again, that part sector has gone, the food sector has gone, it's now luxury flats. But you can see the timing seems to fit that all these things start to reappear when we start to get affordable energy. And looking back to what to me is a shame is the loss of the gas holder. People were divided on this. I think it, I think it was beautiful, but there are those who think it, it wasn't. And it might have been pretty handy to, for us right now in these interesting times of energy shortages. It was demolished in December 2018. There, there are the, the visible gas, gas pipes around Ketz Heights where this was taken, this picture was taken. Uh, are redundant, but the, 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 there's a live and very active gas line running directly underneath Ketz Heights. So, winding up, this is a, a view, a, a drone view of, of the lost gas holder, and a reminder of the industrial heritage we've lost. The end of an era, but topically it looks as if gas too is on its way out. A new industrial revolution with renewable energy at its centre. I think we're going to see that. Maybe it won't be very long before we see gas something as old fashioned as horse drawn carts. So finally, some acknowledgements, and that's it. <laughs>